Hey, this is Andy Larson from The Last Comic Shop, and thank you again for joining us for Comics Talk After 10 p.m. Yes, kind of a sister show to our main podcast that you can listen to every single Tuesday by just going out to www.lastcomicshoppodcast.com. It's a terrific place where you can find all those links. Uh, links to Twitter, like we're here right now, Instagram, or our YouTube links out there, and all of those variety of podcasting platforms, whether it's Apple Podcasts or Google Play or Spotify or any of them. I mean, there's a ton of them. And all the links right out there, www.lastcomicshoppodcast.com. Or you can just listen to our shows there because they're all there. And they're all evergreen. So if you've missed an episode or you're new to our show or new to, uh, you know, just listening to this comic stock after 10, uh, make sure that you go out and uh, see what's available via our archives. We've got lots of comic book reviews, and that's what we do every single week. We uh, pick a book, we read a book, and then we talk about a book. And then we also talk about some other cool comic book stuff. But this comic book's talk after 10 is an opportunity for us to do a little bit more current eventy kind of stuff. And uh, one thing that we're going to be talking about today is uh, Wakanda Forever. Uh, Chad and I saw that last night. And uh, hopefully we're going to get some good participation from our Twitter community uh, tonight. And we'll be able to talk. Now, again, coming up on the uh, last Comic Shop podcast this week, this Tuesday, we're going to have... Uh, more of a official review from the last comic shop of Black Panther Wakanda Forever. Uh, our our co-host uh, Jay Scott is also going to be joining us on that program, so he'll be able to give his thoughts on that movie as well as, of course, a comic book review because we are a comic book podcast. And of course, uh, one of the uh, the comic book that we picked uh, for this week's show, again, out there at www.lastcomicshoppodcast.com, will be uh, a review of the current Black Panther Penguins Classic Collection. So uh, if you're new to Black Panther, if you've just seen some of the MCU uh, movies, or maybe you've read some of the more uh, recent Black Panther uh, uh, series out by Marvel, uh, you can definitely uh, check out uh, our review of a great collection that's available not just in comic book shops, but in bookstores right now. Uh, Penguin has put out uh, not only a, a Black Panther collection, but also a Spider-Man collection and a Captain America collection. And they do kind of bounce around a little bit. They don't tell like one particular portion of the stories in this particular uh, collection uh, for Black Panther. It is not only his first appearance in the first uh, in in issues fifty two and fifty three of the original Fantastic Four run done by Stan Lee and Jack Kirby, uh, but it's also got a great Bronze Age run done by Don McGregor with art primarily by Billy Graham, um, who was the first African American to actually work on the Black Panther series. And uh, together they crafted a tale called Panther's Rage, uh, which was one of the first continuing storylines in comics uh, over issue after issue after issue. And so uh, not only do you get that, but you also get uh, Black Panther versus the Ku Klux Klan. That's right. Um, Black Panther goes after the Klan in the last three issues of this particular volume. So if you're interested in all of that, Make sure that you're tuning in this Tuesday. Get out to uh, lastcomicshoppodcast.com, rate, review, and subscribe. And there is my co-host, Chad Smith. Let's go ahead and make him a co-host in this thing as well. So, yes, one of the things we're going to be talking about is just kind of collecting our thoughts. Um, there he How's it going, dude? It is going well, sir. How are you doing this evening? Ah, it's all good in this particular hood. Yeah, I was just uh, getting everybody that may be listening. Ooh, we're getting a little feedback from you there, buddy. Uh Uh-oh. Yeah, just kind of crackly a little bit. Let's see if it goes away. But uh, long story short, I was just uh, teasing what was coming up on the podcast later on this week on Tuesday with the Black Panther, uh, you know, Penguin Classics Collection. And uh, yeah. 
And so beautiful stuff. Am I still feedback? No, it sounds great now. Yeah. And I mean, okay. it's, uh, you have that collection too, right? In hardback or, um, uh, I may have read it. I bought the captain America one. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> but I may have gone to the bookstore to read the uh, the hardcover one. Right. Well, I will say, Chad, uh, uh, not to tease the podcast, but he does comment about how it's it's missing one uh, important thing: those Penguin Collection classics that come out in the hardbacks, and that's a dust cover because they oh. <laughs> the fingerprints. I was. It's not missing anything. You can see every time you pick them up. <laughs> uh, they are permanently imprinted. Right. Right. Real quickly, Chad, uh, are there any other Black Panther series that you've read over the years that you might want to talk about as, as folks might be listening to this in a recording? Uh, anyone's jumped to mind that you think are particularly good? Oh, boy. Um, so my back Black Panther experience isn't that thorough. I mean, I remember reading the Reggie Hudlin, uh, John Romita Jr. run. Yes. From the Marvel Knights. And that was pretty solid. And uh, a couple of his sins in the Fantastic Four, including, I want to say it was post-Civil War, where Black Panther and Storm took over. Ah, yeah, I was wondering. Uh, for Reed and Sue. I was wondering uh, about that part, because uh, that, that was a portion that I did not read. So um, I was interested to hear. That's a solid, yeah. se- that's a solid group of... It's pretty fun. I want to say it was J. Michael Straczynski. Okay. But uh, another Black Panther run, super underrated, um, and it's almost like people tend to forget about it for whatever reason, but uh, coming out of Shadowland, okay. everybody knows Daredevil sucked, <laughs> and so <laughs> they gave the book to Black Panther, and it had art on occasion by Francesco Francavilla, and it was a, a masterful book for a, you know, a good year, I want to say, plus... Okay. Yeah. So that's where Black Panther basically fills in for Daredevil or. Yeah. He moves to New York for a time. Okay. All right. And yeah. he's in Hell's Kitchen. And I think you've talked about that in the past, which, um, yeah, I might have to jump on that. The biggest uh, Black Panther. Uh, I've had the coats run on my uh, digital reader for the longest time. And I haven't ever. I don't know. Like. I keep on, I, I've read like the first two issues, like six or seven times. So I keep on wanting to be like, oh, I'll just keep this. No, nah, I never, I never go back to it. I just, I, I don't know. But um, I will say that one of my favorite Black Panther runs happens all within New Avengers by Hickman, uh, leading up to the uh, incursions and the Civil War, not the Civil War, but the Secret Wars. Um, that's some of the greatest stuff. And if you really want some, some Black Panther versus Namor. Uh, that's where all those roots come from. Um, you know, it's all because of that particular series. And uh, it's just really good because you can see these two guys and they're really, really powerful. Uh, and they're making like universally changing decisions. And I, I just think that's fascinating from like, what would you do with ultimate power? And if you had to make these decisions on a scale that massive, like it's, it's interesting right. stuff. So, and that part was the first time I, I really got used to black Panther and the undead right. sort of thing. Like that was weird, weird, wild stuff. <laughs> Is that your Johnny Carson? That's right. My, yeah. Well, in any case, um, while we're waiting for other folks to join, um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about Chad, about what you picked up at the comic book shop this week. I know you, uh, sent some pictures, but, uh, have you, have you, you know, paged through any of the stuff from your, your stack this week? Oh man. So I went to the comic shop and you had posted on the, the picks of the week or whatever, the Superman death of Superman anniversary special and i was all excited for it because we've just been talking to all those folks who were part of the death of superman story which we didn't think to ask about this one that was coming out like (laughs) in a week but uh that's neither here nor there but uh so i picked up the issue uh or what i thought it was and went back home and i'm like oh man i grabbed the facsimile instead so it was basically the same comic that i bought 30 years ago but i was able to rectify it today 
I um, did I tell you about my squirrel girl thing? You did not tell me about your squirrel girl. Tell me about it now. Oh, oh man. So in Baltimore, I'm picking up uh, trades left and right. You were there. You saw mm-hmm. the stacks. And so uh, my squirrel girl collection, I've been able to get in hardback. They have like these hardback editions, and they're basically two trades full at once. And so I was able to pick volumes three and four. I had one and two. My uh, volume one, I've got a cool little picture from Erica Henderson sketch oh, yeah, in there. Yeah. I've seen that. Uh, yeah. It's super awesome. But uh, so I, I come back and I'm checking it out and I'm like, wait a minute. There's, you know, this doesn't end at the end of the story. Squirrel Girl runs through issue 50 and then stops. And so I was like, oh, I'm going to need to pick up volume five. And I was like, what the heck? I'll even pay full price for volume mm-hmm. five. And I, I go and I look online. There is no volume five. Wow. And then even worse, because they are there are two trades, um, and this one would have contained volumes, I want to say eleven and twelve. Um, I was like, all right, well, I'll just I'll just pick up the trades. Volume eleven was out of print and like crazy expensive, like sixty dollars plus on Amazon. And so I was like, oh no. <laughs> And I, I love Squirrel Girl, but I, I, I never read it in issues. You know, I, I may have picked up a random issue here or there if it was something special going on. But I always would just wait and let them stack up. And I'm like, wait a minute, what am I going to do if, you know, they don't produce volume five for whatever reason? And volume 11 super, you know, out of print everywhere. And so I was like, I need to start scouring stores to make sure or see if they mm-hmm. have it. And so today I went to uh, Phantom in Pittsburgh. Okay. And they had the Squirrel Girls Volume 11 and 12, the the paperback versions. So I paid retail price for those like a sucker. But at least I wasn't dropping 60 bucks for Volume 11. No, that's true. And then they also had that Death of Superman issue, that Superman special that uh, I was looking for initially. Ah. And thanks to uh, Sushi Fuku taking some time with my veggie spring rolls <laughs> i was able to take time to sit and read through that particular okay. issue uh and it's, it's pretty good it was a fun little nostalgia trip um there are a couple of different stories in there there's one written by uh jerry ordway that's all about ma and pa kent and they're talking about clark and you know him giving his all and in the background the superman versus doomsday fight is happening on the news um, there's a great story with Louis Simonson with steel, okay. uh, John Henry irons, who's basically on his way to help Superman. And he keeps getting distracted by having to help all these people. Uh, that was a real fun story. There's, there's a guardian story. And then there's one where, uh, uh, Jonathan okay. Kent finds out about the death of Superman in school. And he's like, you never told me about this. And as Lois and Clark are explaining it to him, wouldn't you know, Another doomsday esque monster uh, emerges and needs to be stopped. Oh, dun, dun, oh dun. boy! I uh, you know, and that one was uh, Dan Jurgens on art, uh, and I I think he did the story with Brett Breeding as well. Okay. Um, but yeah, so it was it was a fun trip to those '90s Superman books. Would you? S- uh, and definitely, if you were a big fan, they're definitely worth checking. Would you out. say? What would you say of the, the, the three you just mentioned? What? What? Which one was there? One that standed out to you, or, or would you think they were all decent? Uh, they were all pretty solid. Um, and and basically, it's it's your mileage may vary as far as uh, those stories. Uh, the Louise Simonson, the Steel one, I, I liked a lot. Okay. Um. So that one's that one's probably up there, but. Uh, I don't know. Mom and Pop Kent are pretty awesome. I, I like John Kent. That one, there were, you know, uh, we, we get the new Doomsday monster and he keeps evolving as the fight goes on. And like, so he ends up with four arms instead of two. Oh. And then he grows wings <laughs> and like shoots lasers out of his eyes. And like, it's just, it's fun and silly and, and, and good stuff. So they're all pretty solid. Okay. Yeah, I, I was just curious, I, you know, because it, it, it's interesting. Uh, I think we should start keeping a checklist of all the folks that we talk to that have worked on Death of Superman. Dan Jurgens seems to be the next on the checklist. Like, we need to talk to Jan- with Dan because we've talked with Jerry. We've talked with Brett. We've talked with Louise. Um, I'd actually like to talk about Mark. What was it? Mike Carlton? Is, was he the... 
Mike Mark Carlin. Carlin. Yeah, he was the uh, he was like the architect. He was the editor. He he was the guy that brought everybody together and kept them on the same page and had those awesome uh, writer artist powwows that uh, everybody speaks very fondly of. Um, yeah, which honestly it surprises me because I just think as a as a creative type. There are certain restrictions that happen when you work with other people and you're not just working with one creative team. You're working with four. Like that had to be something crazy pants to deal with. Yeah, but he seemed to he seemed to run a tight ship and in a way that uh, allowed everybody to still maintain, you know, quote unquote egos and 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 and, and be able to create, you know, and, and, and feel feel like they were part of a team and, and, and collaborate well. So like kudos to him. That's like, that can be tough. And so like, you know, that would be an interesting uh, interview as well to hear how he, uh, I'm not going to even say, you know, wrangled cats because everybody, everybody <laughs> that we've talked to, they're very, very pleasant people. It's just that, you know, they all creative people have creativity. And sometimes you come to that table and you've got the creativity and you lay it out there and somebody says, no, I don't like that idea. And it's sometimes hard to put that aside and be like, you know, but you, 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 you know, as well as me that sometimes out of that conflict, if you have somebody that can maintain a calm hand, uh, those con conflicts can be resolved and then end up coming up with even better stuff out of it. So, uh, heck yeah. And so, yeah, the death of Superman, that's one of those stories, too, that, uh, geez, Louise, I, I can't believe it's been 30 years, but I, I think it's aged even better than when it was coming mm -hmm. out. Like, at the time, I, I don't know, I, I was too in the forest, or, you know, you can't see the forest for the trees or whatever the expression mm -hmm. was, um, or it's... Uh, I don't know. There were parts that I was like, ah, I don't know. But the as I go back to it, I've you know checked out little things here and there, and they go back and they dip their toes back in. It, it was just a nice time to establish what Superman meant and how Superman, imp how important Superman is, right? You know, to the culture. Yeah, at large. Well, I, I I I remember talking with Louis Simonson about Funeral for a Friend, kind of like that middle part of that you know the trilogy of of series is there. And honestly, I think our, our co-host Jay Scott hit the nail on the head that that's in some ways probably the one that's aged the best because it's a really just a tale about like, well, what does Superman mean to you? Like, what does Superman mean? Uh, you know, if Superman was gone, like, how would you react to that? And I think that's, you know, more than a big fight or a convoluted way of bringing him back. That's kind of... Uh, I don't know, like a little more of a touchstone, like people can can reflect a little bit more. And as a result, I think it ages like like a fine wine. Or, or, or <laughs> There you go. The more you're ready to embrace all the, the wackiness of the 90s and the, the folks like Guardian and the alien head that was giving him instructions and, you know, like just all that weird stuff that was happening in those Superman books yeah. at the time. Yeah. I was going to say, to to jump totally off on a different topic, uh, what did you think about the uh, Kevin Conroy news today? Oh, boy. That? Yeah, I was I was hoping that we talk about a little bit about that. It, it kind of was sudden, kind of came out of nowhere, I won't lie. It was kind of like uh, a little bit like uh, Chadwick Boseman for me because like mm -hmm. he, I didn't know that he was ill. Or, and sometimes you see that stuff like, again, you know, if you were paying attention to Twitter, you realize what George Perez was going through. And, you know, they were kind enough to give us as fans like I don't I don't know, like they, you know, they, they they kept us in the loop a little bit about it. So we were we were prepared for when for when when George passed away. But it was again, it's like it's like it's it's like Chadwick Boseman or, or Neil Adams kind of comes out of nowhere and reminds you that, like, yeah, that's life. Um and it's really sad. Uh, you know, the outpouring uh, from fans has been wonderful to see. Uh, everybody seems yeah. to have a story about how wonderful of a guy he was. Um, oh, yeah. And he just he spoke to a generation. I mean, as many people that came in with that Batman movie in 89, it was that Batman cartoon that kept people oh, around. Oh, yeah. And those are some of the best stories, Batman stories ever. I mean, it, it's it. I I, I told uh, 
I told my kids, cause again, like they weren't around for this and they've, they've only, you know, and, and they've watched Batman since then. But I said, do you realize like Batman was one of the, they actually put that in prime time. It was of course on a Sunday, but they, it was so popular that Batman, the animated series that they developed like a version of that and put it on Sunday nights at like, you know, seven thirty, eight o'clock on Fox because they were, it was, they knew people were going to watch it. It was, it was must watch TV back then. If you were, you know, a teenager and it got a whole generation of folks into Batman. Uh, oh, heck yeah. It, did you get a chance this year uh, or in this past year? I want to say whenever they released that pride special to check out the, the Kevin Conroy. I story? did not. No, I did not. Did you want to, did, did you want to speak a little bit about that? Did you check it out? Uh, yes. I, I picked it up just because I'd heard good things and man, he um he just had gone through some stuff as uh, a closeted gay man and it you know he was talking about his struggles uh and dealing with that and dealing with his own um like uh perceptions or you know how he felt and how he was treated by other people in the industry and when you take that and then you add it into the other big dark knight uh cartoon creator book that i read the uh the paul dini biography yes, yeah where he got mugged and was going through all these different things that self done there were some people on that show that were really working through some stuff yeah yeah and you know it, it's just it's 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 cr- incredible to see like what great stuff people were able to make even though you know they're all working through these issues they're all working through you know, and some in some cases traumas that are you know way way bigger than your run of the mill. Uh, you know, oh, I need to pick up barbecue sauce style issues. <laughs> well, Spider Man knows how big of a deal that can yeah. be. Uh, let's not. You don't want to let it make down. light I mean, of barbecue still. sauce. But no, I. Um, <laughs> but that that's the thing. Like sometimes that's how true great art is made, though, is, is through is through unfortunately pain and working through things. Um, you know, it's unfortunate that's the way it is, but that is the way it is. It's, it's always been that way. Uh, you know, that's where real drama comes from. That's where real emotion comes from. And, and, and again, it's going to be, I don't, it's, it's weird for me to say, but like, I don't, without Kevin Conroy doing the bat, the voice of Batman, I mean, it's the first, it's the voice I hear. And whenever I'm like watching any sort of either animated series with Batman, if I don't hear that voice, it's very jarring to me nowadays. Like, I'm like, I don't, I don't like this at all. Like this, this, this isn't, this isn't right. Uh, But it did make me think back and, you know, fond memories of that Batman, the animated TV series real quickly, Chad, do you have a, a favorite episode that jumps to mind? I know there was a lot of folks on Twitter today and in the, in the wake of his passing, commenting on favorite episodes of theirs and his work on them. Are you there? Well, I know I'm on yeah, mute here. You were muted. That's okay. sorry. I, I'm talking on mute. But uh, the ones that stick out for me, obviously, the uh, the first round of uh, Mister Freeze, mm-hmm. the Heart of Ice episodes, and then the uh, the Dick Grayson episodes. Where I felt like the comics had hadn't really gone as well into Dick Grayson's origin as they did in those episodes where he, he meets the the Zukos and uh like those are just the ones that right off the top of my head uh stand out. Then there's the one with uh, the the coulda got him yeah. or shoulda had him or whatever yeah. it was. That one was a great episode. Couple of ones. I don't know what well, a couple of ones that jumped to my head. Uh the man that the it was it the man that killed Batman? Uh Okay. Uh, do you remember that one? Uh, where, is that the one where the Joker has the guy who owes him a favor? No, no, no. That's because that one. Was that a is one a good too. one. This one is about <laughs> uh, a lowly, um, a lowly guy underneath Rupert, uh, the the big boss. What was his name? Ru- uh, right. Rupert. Okay. Rupert. Is, well, what's his name? Green. He looks like the kingpin, right? He's got silver yeah. hair or whatever. Uh, any case, he has like a small time thug underneath him, somebody like Louis the Fish or something. And like he gets in this fight with he he's on a job with a bunch of other criminals and Batman comes and breaks it up and accidentally it looks like he kills Batman. 
And, and after he does it, he thinks like the world's going to be great. And for a few seconds it is, but then like Joker decides he's going to kill him because like, you know, he took away Batman and that was his job to do. And like (laughs) at the end, it turns out Batman didn't die and he saves the guy, but he gets sent to prison and everybody, he, he finally gets all that recognition reward because they're all like, that's the guy that almost got Batman. And like, he's just like this <laughs> small nerdy guy with glasses. And uh, if you've never heard of the episode, it's really, really good. Cause it's, it's not again, it's not about Batman. It's about this guy, you know, uh, it's almost like that could have got him. Like it's, it's, it's Batman's tertiary to do the whole story. There's another, there's another two ones that I really love. The first episode of Batman, the animated series I ever saw, which was the first episode with the scarecrow, where like Batman is injected with fear serum and like he's on a there's like a blimp in the air and and okay is that the one where Robin's in no nope, that was the second one the first one actually okay. has a scarier looking scarecrow because he doesn't have like the twiggy hair or the big mouth with the jagged teeth he's like his head's like uh. very uh, it almost just looks like uh, two holes in a mouth cut into fabric so he look it's very like gaunt and like almost ghastly. And I always thought it was way more effective as a, uh, cause it's almost, it's almost like uh, featureless. Um, so it almost just looks like, you know, something out of like uh, the slender man or somebody that's coming out of the, the darkness with no eyes and no distinguishing features. And so I always thought that was more terrifying than what you would see later. I actually never liked the scarecrow after that episode cause they screwed it up, but that one, that oh, episode man. is really great because that's where he, uh, I think he says the, the the speech about I am the knight, I am Batman because he's got to pump himself up to get rid of the fear toxin. Oh, uh, yeah, I am Batman. Yes, and so there, that episode's great. And there's another great one, a two-parter that deals with these robots that are taking over folks in, in Gotham City. And that one's just an interesting okay. one from like a science fiction perspective. And I feel like that might be a good one to revisit due to the fact that like Kevin Conroy really gets to spread his wings a little bit in that because he gets to play not only Batman, but there's a lot of Bruce Wayne in that. Oh, and shit. I for completely forgot about that. I, do you remember the episode with, I'm sorry, with the Mad Hatter where basically Mad Hatter gives Batman everything he ever wanted and it's still not enough? Do you remember this? I don't remember that. That one. one what season? Was that, it's that towards. It's early? towards the end of the original before they okay. went to Batman and Robin. But there's a great episode where basically Batman's trailing the 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 Mad Hatter. He goes into some warehouse and he blacks out. And the next thing he knows, he's waking up in bed. He's married to Selena Kyle. His parents haven't died. He gets basically everything that he wants, and yet he knows that there's something wrong. And at the end of the day, he figures it all out that he's not, it's not reality that he's been being mind, like basically mind controlled by the Mad Hatter and he breaks free and he basically like Mad Hatter at the end of the day, he's like, what's your problem? I just gave you everything you ever wanted. And still you, you gave it all up just to beat the tar out of me. And it's just like, <laughs> I don't know. It's a, that's another great one. Uh, I fr- Sounds a lot like uh, the Superman for the man who exactly. has everything. But, uh. Exactly. Except it's, it's more, uh, it's, you know, it, nobody pulls, nobody pulls the thing off of Batman. He figures he, he pulls it off of himself. He pulls the card out of his hat or whatever it is. And it's, it's really good, but all these episodes are available on what the uh, HBO max. So maybe I'm going to rewatch a couple of them in honor of there Kevin Conroy. I- I know there's a couple towards the uh, the later part of the seasons, and uh, I I didn't watch any of the Batman and Robin adventures. Yeah, so I, I'm due to go back and check oh, those, those are out. good. The, the animation's a little bit different, but um, they're still really good stories. Especially they bring Nightwing in towards the end, and it's an interesting. Um, you know, you could see that they were setting stuff up. And, you know, again, if you're then interested in moving on to Justice League and the even better show, Justice League uh, Unlimited. Unlimited. That's that's like the high point. After that, the Tim verse. Oh, I just wish that it would have continued. But whatever. Whatever. <laughs> we got a lot of great cartoons. We did. 
we did. So yeah, those are some a couple of episodes. I'm gonna. I'm. I. In fact, after we're done here, I'm gonna rewatch that episode with the Mad Hatter because that one was. Uh, and I'll have to text you what the the title is. So, um, <laughs> yeah, it, uh, there's been a couple of people that have shown up. I I think we're gonna stay on here for another half an hour. So I'm gonna be on until 11:30. Um, have you had an opportunity to digest Wakanda forever? Not to tease what we might talk about on podcast this week but you've have you had an, uh, an opportunity to digest all of it yeah i i think uh we had the conversation last night coming out of there where i uh, i think i i've settled in where the the how can i phrase this what they had to accomplish the challenge was set and i think they rose and met the challenge of what they had to deal with uh, really well. Uh, I think the movie deals with grief, uh, you know, incredibly tactfully, and uh, they touch all those notes they need to touch upon to make you feel like it isn't like Star Wars where they're just CGIing, uh, you know, characters back to life and that sort of thing. I thought everything was done in a really classy way. Um, and even like all the characters are introduced, and I'm not going to spoil anything. All that was done really well and everything you know I could get behind. But at the end of the day, I feel like it was a very good movie, not a great okay. one. Well, yeah, I I think that I had, you know, my initial thought I think still stands and I'll, I'll elaborate this later on in this week. But um, I feel like for me, anything it's again, it's hard for me to 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 basically separate any of these MCU movies from any of the other ones at this point. They're all just like, an, again, another episode in some sort of long continuing narrative that I'm, I'm just tuning in for and getting some, again, kind of like comic books, right? Like, I think that's the thing. Like they're starting to become in some ways comic books to me where I was just like, no, that was a good comic book. I might not remember it. Like, you know, all the bits and pieces, like, 10 years later for some of them, but I could still say like, yeah, that was good. Like that was worth my time and my effort to read it. Um, and I feel like this was that same way. I think that in order for an MCU movie and now in my opinion to be successful, it has to do three things. It has to be first and foremost energetic. Uh, it has to have an, an energy all of its own, which can kind of keep me interested for the full duration of the movie. Some of them have not done that. It has to have real, real stakes and real drama, um, like that. It, it's kind of based in some sort of, I don't know, uh, something that you can relate to as a human being. Like that's what's sometimes the problem with DC movies is you can't really relate to any of them. You're like, I don't know what did none of none of this is real human drama. Like this is something else. And then number three for me is that it has to keep the mer- the narrative moving forward. And I think I think of the three things this did, I think the last two did it in spades. Um, I think it had real human drama. And I think that if nothing else, there were a lot of things that kept that moved the co- collective narrative forward. Unlike movies like, I don't know, maybe Shang-Chi, which eh, maybe it filled in some background components, but it didn't really move the, the and like Eternals was awful at that. Like Eternals didn't move anything. And I think that's why I was so I was actually in retrospect the most disappointed about it because it didn't really it didn't really matter. Like it had nothing to do with the greater narrative whatsoever. It put a couple of chess pieces out on the board, but you were just like, no, this has nothing to do with the, the bigger saga. So I uh and it was boring. Yeah, that too. That's don't forget that. Right. Part. So it, that that one failed on all three. No human motion because they were all gods and nobody cared. It didn't have enough energy or unique tone for me to, 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 to care about two and a half hours. And then, yeah, it didn't move the narrative forward. So, yeah, this is, I think, the, this is the anti-Eternals in some ways. Uh, I think, I think uh, yeah, no, that, that's my, my take. So. But, yeah, I, I do worry that uh, the MCU is turning into Star Wars where for a long time the Star Wars movies would come out and you'd go to the theater, and at least for me, I'd watch the movies, I'd be entertained by them, and then I'd walk out and do whatever was next. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, uh, they were fine movies, but they never really resonated or made an impact. Or, you know, it was something where a day or two after the movie, you know, I wasn't talking about it. Like, 
they didn't generate that excitement. They were just kind of playing it safe. Okay. And I, I, I think a lot of Marvel movies, they're in that rut where it's like, okay, they're, they're advancing the story, but they're not taking the big risks to uh, like the early Marvel movies, I guess. I just felt like you would walk out of guardians of the galaxy and like, what the heck are they doing? They've got talking trees and <laughs> raccoons or like captain America too, where it's like, Oh, you have to watch this. I must've watched that movie five times that summer with different people. Just be like, no, you got to go see it. Like, <laughs> but I, I, I haven't had that level of excitement outside of Spider-Man, which wasn't really a Marvel movie. Like it's a Sony right. movie, not a Marvel movie. Well, I, I, you know, a couple things that, you know, based on what you said, um, see, I, I take kind of an opposite standpoint in that, like, for the most part, I'm, you know, most movies that I watch, I'm just there to be entertained. I don't know why that would be different for an MCU movie. Like, just because they're characters that I like doesn't mean, like, it has to be, you know, the Godfather every single time I go to the theater. It just needs to entertain me for a while, and I have to go away going, hey, I spent my money on something, and I was good. And, 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 and again, like, if I go and rewatch it once or twice, great. And I feel like for some of these movies, like Spider-Man or the ones that I've really liked of the MCU, most of the time, at least for me, the, 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 the general thread has been that I went into those movies really caring about the character to begin with. Like, I liked, I liked Captain America, and, I, and that's why, and I've grown up liking Captain America. I think that's why I like the Captain America movie so much, because it's a character I give a shit about. Same thing with Spider-Man. I give a shit about him. Like some of these other characters. Eh. I mean, even Guardians of the Galaxy. Like everybody was walking out of that one being like, what the hell are they doing? And I was like, it was good. It was a decent movie. It moved the plot along. Uh, but I was just like, I don't care about any of these folks. And I really still don't care about the Guardians of the Galaxy. Honestly. Oh, wow. Yeah. See, I love I love those found family stories. Those always get well, me. I, I will say that I enjoyed uh, I think enjoyed Guardians of the Galaxy 2 a lot more. I think I was at a certain point in my life for Guardians of the Galaxy 2. I, it had been very shortly after my dad passed. And I was going through some things. So that movie meant a lot to me. But Guardians of the Galaxy 1 was just like, meh. You know, I, I, I'm not going to say it was bad. Like, don't get me wrong. Like, again, <laughs> I think Guardians of the Galaxy 1 did the three things it was supposed to. And here comes George. That's great. We'll invite him to speak. Uh, but yeah, Guardians of the Galaxy was, again, to my three tenets of a good MCU movie. It was energetic. It had real human drama. It moved the narrative forward. That's all I want. I, I, that, give him, take, take my money and, and then just leave. Hey, <laughs> hey George, how you doing? You there, buddy? Sorry. Hey. Hey, hey Chad. Doing well. How are you guys? We're doing well. Thank you so much for joining tonight. We're gonna be on for another half an hour, so I'm glad that you were able to sneak on here. We were just talking a little bit about Black Panther. We're gonna have a as I was teasing, we're gonna talk a little bit more about it on our podcast later uh this week. Uh, but yeah, we, have you seen the movie, George? I have not. I was going to try to see it tomorrow or maybe do the unthinkable and skip football on Sunday to see it. Oh, what? what? Yeah, yeah. Um, hmm, I don't it's know. It's Chargers Niners. It, it looks like a fun game. I don't know. <laughs> <I'm> torn. <laughs> yeah. It, it, I, I don't know. I, I, I would, I don't know if it's, it's, it's worthy missing football unless again, it's a, uh, you know, whatever. I, I, I think try to see it tomorrow, but we'll, we'll try to keep the spoilers to, uh, to a minimum then. Um, cool. I just, uh, as I was mentioning, like, I think that, you know, and Chad says that the MCU has been playing it safe recently, that it, there's, you know, these movies that aren't really wowing him. Um, I'm more of the opinion that I'm just like, look, it's another movie that I didn't fall asleep in the middle of. So I'm okay with it. Like, <laughs> right. I, I, you know, I get, is that a black Adam shot? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, if the shoe fits, uh, I may have slept through a half an hour's worth of black Adam, but honestly, I don't think I missed a damn thing. <laughs> ah, that's a cold glass of haterade. That's, that's, that's <laughs> something else. Um, 
Well, I, I yeah, I don't I don't know what what do you think about MCU movies in general, George? Like, do you feel like uh, the last couple have been you know I don't know good bad? What do you think? I think they've been fine. I enjoy them i just don't care as much as i used to and i think i cared more because they kind of laid out a goal right like at the end of avengers we saw thanos so we knew what we were building towards and like so far they've hinted at kang but it seems like his big breakout as like the phase four baddie is going to be in ant-man and the wasp quantumania right right we got a little tease of it in loki but so far it kind of seems like it's just going for vibes and the vibes have been fine, but like, I don't think vibes alone makes like a great movie. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, On the uh, Ant-Man quantum mania tip, does Evangeline Lilly look really old? (laughs) Maybe it's just because she's going up against Paul Rudd, but it's like she has aged and he has not. And it is shocking. Well, it's also that they've got Cassie Lang in there. And like, so they're putting her next to Paul Rudd and you're just like, there was a couple scenes when I was looking and I was just like, cause, cause Cassie Lang looks like Evangeline Lilly from the last movie, right? Like, cause she's got like the long ponytail thing going on and a similar suit. So it's just like, there were a couple scenes where I was just like, wait a second. No, that's not a, that's not Wasp. That's, that's stature. And I was, I was like, oh, okay. That's. But I, I don't know. I'm I'm super excited. I did turn over like that was uh, we saw it in 3D last night, George. And uh, so we got to see Quantum Mania, the trailer in 3D. And I just looked at Chad and I said, that's a movie I'm going to have to see in 3D. Because like some of the visuals, especially when they go into that quantum realm, my God, like I was just like, no, I, I got to see this in 3D. This looks this looks too too. This is this is great. Like, uh, I think I had commented that that's. That's what I was hoping that we would get a little bit more in the Doctor Strange movies when they he went to like the dark dimension and all the Steve Ditko esque stuff, because like right. that kind of like I don't know floating things and things on top of other I, I don't know everything looked organic mm-hmm. that that's that's what I was looking for from some sort of trippy other place. So, but my hard hitting question is. Do we have to watch all the movies in 3D now they're doing another Avatar? <laughs> is that going to be a thing again? <laughs> I I have I, I my secret shame, I never saw the first Avatar. That's my secret shame. So it it's not a shame, but like I just don't know how you missed it. <laughs> like it was just, yeah, it was like standard issue. Well, I'm a, I'm a little younger than you guys, and so when I went to college, I went to college in 2008. And that was like two years after the PlayStation three came out. And that was like the first Blu-ray player people could like really afford. Yeah. And the two Blu-rays that everyone had when I was in college, they only had two because they were still so expensive and it was still like the debate between Blu-ray and HD DVD. But the two Blu-rays that everyone had were avatar and planet earth, like the BBC series. Ah. (laughs) See, we are older George, because for us it was similar with the PlayStation three. But everybody had a copy of the yes. Matrix. Yeah, with, with the PlayStation. We were all two, watching yeah. Bullet Time. <laughs> it was it was Matrix. Everybody had a copy of Fight Club. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, I think those were the first two. Uh, yeah, that it was those two, and then Army of Darkness. I think those were my first three DVDs. That they came standard issue after a while with the DVD player. Yeah. They just gave you a copy of Matrix because they. But no, what happened was uh, for some reason I. I Honestly, I'm not a huge James Cameron fan. I'm not. Like, I like some of his movies. I actually like more of his earlier movies. Um, And, you know, I I like Terminator. I like Terminator 2. I like Aliens. I think Aliens is my favorite uh, uh, James Cameron movie, other than maybe True Lies, which I really love. I love True Lies. That's a great (laughs) Wait, wait, wait. You just, you just cool. listed like all of his movies. <laughs> like, I was going to say, can we put a pin in this though? Because I want to, George, did you not see Avatar in 3D? I did. Did you see it on Blu ray instead? I did see it in 3D. Okay. Whew. I saw it in 3D twice, and then I saw it 2D once just to like, you know, get a test to see like if there was actually a difference or not. And the 3D was fun, but then like it was built for 3D, and then a whole bunch of movies that followed were just sort of retrofitted for 3d like i I saw thor in 3d as well because that was oh yeah i was living in england at the time and that was the only theater that was playing thor oh so 
So that was was it Thor or Thor two? Uh, the first Thor. Okay, because I, I remember the Thor two was in three D as well. The only other three D movie I remember like getting uh, a jolt out of was the GI Joe two with the Rock as Roadblock, and they have a really cool three D fight sequence on the side of a mountain. Mm-hmm. But other than that, the three D like, uh. but Avatar man like. I, I was not a fan of the overall Avatar movie, but for like a half an hour, it was great. It was so beautifully, like, just the visuals were so interesting. But then the movie went on for another two and a half hours. I'm like, no. <laughs> yeah. Someone please stop. Well, this. no, that was the thing. I, uh, I, I think James Cameron was ruined by, uh, for me, by, by Titanic. Because now, like, I remember having to see Titanic in the theater like three times, three or four times, because my girlfriend at the time loved that movie. And so, like, she just dragged me to it, like, constantly. And I hated that movie. So I was like, anything that James Cameron makes at this point is going to be garbage. <laughs> and so he's like, Avatar. And I'm like, this is garbage. And so, like, I didn't yeah. go see it. And but by the time that after I missed it in 3D, I was just like, well, why am I going to watch it on Blu-ray? Like, why am I going to watch it? Like, didn't I just miss the whole point of watching this thing? Because I didn't see it on the big screen in 3D. So I said, ah, screw it. I'm not going to do it. See, Titanic for you was um, was the notebook for my generation. <laughs> Where that was the one that every every girlfriend would be like, can we just put that on? And it's like, we could, yeah, sure, we could. Or... Um, there's a really great movie I don't think you have seen. It's called Roadhouse. <laughs> and I, I don't think Ryan Gosling's in that one though. No, but it's it's great. 1987, Patrick Swayze is, and you're gonna you're gonna love it. It's my way or the highway. Roadhouse. <laughs> yeah, and also 1987, Sam Elliott. That does something for some people too, and you got Kelly Lynch. Like, it's it's great. You're gonna love it. You're my new <laughs> Saturday night thing. <laughs> 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 but no, I um. No, I, my wife likes the notebook too. There's like a whole variety. It's weird. My wife, I was telling Chad, my wife has like all these movies that like, if they come on like TNT or whatever, she'll just leave them on. And she'll be just like, I just put that on. And I'll just. Yeah. But the notebook is not the interesting one of that. Uh, that <laughs> no, it's not. The most interesting one she has is the day after tomorrow. <laughs> She's like, okay, I'm like yeah. the, the ice wolves and Jake Gyllenhaal. She's like, yeah, I just like that movie. You know, and I'm just like, what? And I'm like, what other ones? And then the other one she has is Air Force One. Get off my plane. She loves. See, work. that was that was my first DVD. So I'm a yes, I completely love that selection by your wife. <laughs> Which, by the way, not to not to say much, um, but there's an interesting theory uh, out there now, uh, and I don't think it spoils too much at all. But there's a theory that in the MCU universe that Thunderbolt Ross is actually now the president of the United States or will be by the time Thunderbolts comes out that actually oh, they're going to be uh, casting uh, Harrison Ford as president Ross, like the Thunderbolt Ross will be the president of the United States. So um, wait, 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 does that um, mean the MCU is doing like a ghetto sequel to air force one where it's not really a sequel to air force? Exactly. One, <laughs> Well, we don't know if he served a second term in Air Force One. So if he served one term, then he can serve another term later. <laughs> there right. you go. It's it's the honest to gosh tooth. And the more I thought about it, I'm like, no, no, I could see that. I could see that. That would be him turning, having the president turn into Red Hawk would be, to Chad's point, <laughs> a, that would definitely be taking a risk <laughs> in terms of right. the narrative. But yeah. Uh, that would be awesome. But no, I thought really. Qu- Go ahead. Sorry, really quick. I heard you guys talking about uh, Guardians of the Galaxy two, and I have to admit, I prefer that one. I think that's like top t- echelon, top tier of the MCU. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that that movie is everything I want it to be. It's so much more emotional. It's so much more meaningful. I think than the first movie, which I feel bad saying because like the first one's all about finding your family, and then it, the second one's all about like making choices about family, right? Right. Right. Yeah. No. Uh, God. It, the movie's great. Yeah. It's um. Yeah. It, I I feel like any time, and it, it sounds weird, but like any time you can make a story about fathers and sons, mothers and daughters, like it's it's it hits something real deep within a lot of folks, and you're just like, okay, yeah, like yeah. this is going to be really deep, impactful stuff, and like I, I uh, 
Oh man, that that scene with Yondu at the end. Oh man, I I was I was bawling. I was yeah. bawling yeah. in the theaters. I mean, that was emotional. But uh, but 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 hear me out. Old school Groot, way better. Old school Groot, <laughs> <laughs> like young Groot, just kind of annoying. The we are Groot, Groot. Yeah, that's the way to go. Oh, uh, the, the, well, the way you complain about kid actors in movies, it's like you kind of got to keep that up for for teenage Groot. It's same, <laughs> it makes it's sense story thing. wise, yeah. but yeah, not as cool, right? But no, there were so many good scenes in that movie. Not to go down that rabbit hole. My other, sec- my second favorite scene in that movie is the the one where Yondu gets his uh, arrow back, and they play that "Come a Little Bit Closer." Because I love that song. I oh, love yeah. that song. And I think it was perfectly used, uh, and it just has such badassness to it. Like it just, oh, it it just, uh, I can't gush enough about that. But like, um, yeah, I can easily say that I'd, I'd watch that movie a lot more times than I would watch the original Garden of the Galaxy at this point. I think, I think that's good for. But no, I, I, it's like the, it's like Empire Strikes Back and Star Wars. The second one's better. Like that's yeah. that's just the way it is. Chad, do you don't, do you not agree? Uh, well, no, I'll still, still ah, I will still stick up for the first one as the superior movie, but uh, I can respect the the differences there. Um, but I was going to say too, getting off the movie tip, George. We're also talking about uh, death and sadness this week. Yeah, is, that's the the topic of the day. Did you happen to check out any of the Superman Death of Superman 30th anniversary stuff? Uh, I didn't. I actually called my I don't have a local comic shop anymore. I still have my shop in San Francisco that I call like once a month and I'll get my book shipped out. And uh, as you guys know, I've been working like crazy recently. I got to uh, like I'm I'm working three jobs. And so I've I've got a little extra money to burn. So I like greatly expanded my pull list with my shop. And I called earlier because nice. I'm like, oh, Superman 30th came out, uh, the new Wildcat series, the JSA stuff. Like I'm I'm so in on all that. Like let me call, let me get this shipment of books early so I can like read them next weekend. That'd be super fun. And I love my dude Daryl at at uh, Cards and Comics Central, but he forgot to add a whole bunch of books to my list. <sighs> So I talked to him today. He's like, I completely forgot about your email. Let me add all that stuff in now. So next week I'll be getting it. So hopefully I'll be reading it soon. Death of Superman. I never cared about Superman until I read that story. It, there was like a oversized telephone book esque trade paperback that came out when I was like a sophomore in high school. And it was twenty four ninety nine, and it was like the entire Death and Return of Superman event. And that was like at that point, my favorite comic I'd ever read. I thought it was excellent. So I'm very excited for this 30th anniversary stuff. Oh, that's awesome. All right, then I will not spoil it, but that was something we touched on earlier. And then the other thing was uh, Kevin Conroy. Do you have any, uh, because you are, you are younger than us. Do you have any uh, Batman, the animated series uh, through justice league unlimited memories or something that stands out for you from Kevin Conroy's run? I dressed up as Batman four years in a row in elementary school. Uh, <laughs> they were my pajamas, and Halloween was my favorite day of the year because I could just wear my pajamas to school. And I would just march down Main Street in the Halloween parade as Batman, and I, I, I loved it. Batman the Animated Series, especially, um, and Batman Returns. Those were like my, my two favorites as a kid. <laughs> Batman Returns is such a weird movie, like especially for kids. Oh, God, that movie like, it... could not be made today the way it was. I, I really don't think it could. <laughs> But it hit, man. It hit. It stuck with so many people. But it, real, yeah, it's just incredible. Real quickly, George, do you have a, a fa- we were talking about favorite episodes of Batman the Animated Series. Do you have one that jumps at it jumps directly to mind as like one that you do you like even now as an adult? The first one that comes to mind is Almost Got Him, like the episode where it's like all the rogues are playing poker, reminiscing about the time they almost killed Batman. Ah, that's one of Chad's favorites too. Yeah, you get all the bad guys. Well, it's just it's that scene from Jaws, right, where they're all just talking about their scars. Like it's that for an entire twenty minutes, and it's just flashbacks. And oh, it's great! I absolutely love that episode. But I want to point out two characters that I really enjoy that I think were created in Batman the Animated Series. Okay, There's that one episode, Baby Doll, about like the woman who never looks older than a child, and so like. Uh, she was on a TV show, 
And then, like, the show got canceled, and then she just kind of, like, snaps years later. And so she, like, kidnaps her old TV family in, like, a, a carnival funhouse almost, and then, like, dares Batman to, to save them, basically. Oh, yeah. I do remember that one. I don't know if that some of them were so so obscure, like uh, the fox. Or there was like the fox, the eagle, and the whatever. Mm. Uh, that those are the terrible trio. The terrible trio. That's right. It. And uh, at the time, I was like, "Who are these people?" And then I had to look it up. I'm like, "Oh yeah, it's the terrible trio." Okay, but who? What, what's another one that jumped? Like that uh, you said there was a second one that's yeah. like. I, I thought he was so boring when I was a kid. I just didn't understand it. And then I rewatched the series. Uh, as those DVDs were coming out, like in high school, I love the clock King. I think that guy is so cool in the animated series. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. He was, he was a DC uh, villain. They made him a lot cooler though in the show. Honestly, like they made him a lot cooler. Well, they fixed uh-huh. him. They fixed Mr. Freeze too. Right. They oh, fixed yeah. a lot of folks. Honestly, um, they fixed them. You know, I was talking about, and I was trying to, do you recall an episode, George, where basically the Mad Hatter takes over uh, a Batman's mind and basically gives him everything he ever wanted? For like chance, he's married. For chance to dream. Yeah, that was a good ah, episode. Ah, yeah. see? Okay. <laughs> yes. And I was telling Chad, Chad, Chad couldn't recall the episode, but I said that's, that's one of the ones that jumps immediately to mind because that's a great great episode in my opinion and uh that's another character i think not to say that the mad hatter wasn't but some of these guys are real gimmicky like the mad hatter you know uh kind of a gimmicky character but uh there was something really cool that what they did with him so he works on a couple in a couple different episodes uh there was another one with uh where they brought hugo strange in which i always thought was kind of interesting and i think it's where like He's trying to sell who Batman's real identity is to like Joker and Penguin show up. And I'm trying to remember, I think it was one of those Batman and Robin episodes. Yeah, um, with, with Two Face. Yeah, and they're, yeah, he's auctioning off the identity. And they, right. kind, they kind of took that for Batman Forever, right? Like they just kind of did that with, uh, with the Riddler. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's too many great episodes of that show. I also, I love Robin's Reckoning, where we, like, learn the origin of Robin. That has, like, one of the most badass moments where, like, they're down by the down by the docks. And Robin oh, yeah. is, like, going down on his motorcycle and just, like, grabs Tony Zuko or whatever his name is, like, by the collar. And, like, Batman, like, really thinks he's about to kill him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like that epi- those yeah. episodes are so good. That's all about choices. That was on my short list, too, man. Those are those are I- great. I, 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 you know, j- to recap, another one was on mine was the first episode I ever saw, which was the first appearance of Scarecrow. Um, and it was before they, they changed the look of Scarecrow, which I never liked. I never liked him with the red, like the straw hair and the big giant toothy grin thing. Like in the first that time you ever see him, he's just like, it's almost like featureless. Like it's just eye holes and a mouth. And uh, it almost looks like a, like a balloon face or whatever. And, oh, yeah, yeah. And he gets Batman, you know, he's on the fear stuff and he's trying to pull himself together. And he, he has to, it, it's just a great episode. And there was another great one with the, do you remember the robot episode? Do you remember the episode where they were making robot duplicates of people in Gotham? Oh, yeah. The, the, and, the, the original secret invasion. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, it was good. It was a really, I think, honestly, for folks, I, I said it before, I'll say it again. If you were a fan of Kevin Conroy, that's a great episode to go back and re-listen to because he plays a variety of different, like, plays Bruce Wayne, he plays Batman, he plays Robot. You know, it, it's it's a good episode. I think it's, uh, I, I remember that being like, when I was like, ah, oh, geez, this is a little bit deep and, and creepy. And but- before. Before we get off the topic, too, the other thing I want to say about Kevin Conroy that I think he does better than any other Batman actor, uh, this side of Adam West, was that he was able to be both Bruce Wayne and Batman and have them be relatable, have them be their own thing, but still like intertwined enough. I don't know. So many actors, like they can either be Batman or they could be a decent Bruce Wayne. But uh, Conroy, his version, uh, he captured the best of both and even matches Malone whenever, you know, they had those yeah. opportunities. Oh, wait, there's another. 
I didn't appreciate this one when I was younger, but uh, I think it's called Fear of Victory, where Joker, or not Joker, Scarecrow starts, like, doxing players on, like, Gotham's, like, yes! team with yep. <laughs> and then just, like, betting against them. Like, it was just him just, like, r- r- rigging gambling, which, as I've gotten older and more into gambling, I'm like, that's genius. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Can you do me a favor? Can you hit up Justin Fields with some of that stuff this weekend? Or, um, I want to bet the under. <laughs> that's yeah, that's hilarious. That's whenever I talk about uh, like that, fa- my favorite being like the first appearance of Scarecrow. Believe it or not, a lot of people say, oh, the one with the, the drugs and the football. And I'm like, no, that was the second episode with Scarecrow. The first one was way at the era. I was like, it's like that one and Man Bat. The first appearance of Ma- that's a great one. Wings of uh, on something leather wings. Right. On leather oh, wings. that was yeah. so, that was the first episode. Yeah, so creepy. You know, it, it has that same feel that uh, the first Mister Freeze does. Where like those are some of my favorite episodes of the Batman the Animated Series, where you get kind of like that almost like sci-fi kind of retro sci-fi feel to them at the same time as you know. They're 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 putting together a lot of pulpy tropes like, mm-hmm. you know, uh, not only crime pulp, but like, again, sci fi pulp and kind of mixing it all together and monster pulp and kind of like saying, yeah, all this stuff is good and all can fit together in a good story. So, yeah, well, the, yeah. there's just, just two points. I know we've got to wrap up soon. Um, it did what I really enjoyed about the Batman. That movie came out this year, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay, yeah, guys, it feels like three years ago, but like just the way they decided to build the world made it feel like it was happening in so many different time periods all at once. Like, like the Bat Computer was like a super high tech computer, but it looked like someone's idea of a computer in the 1940s, right? right? Like, and the fact that there was like dirigibles and blimps patrolling Gotham City, which is like not that different than you know, the helicopters that were constantly hovering over Los Angeles as they were making these episodes in the nineties and in, in, uh, in in Hollywood. Like, it's just the way they made it feel like it was happening at all these different time periods was just splendid. Like it, it made it forever relevant. And like the score itself took it and made it. So it was always going to be, a, a bopping score, you know, like they didn't root it in any one time period. They just gave it like this classical sound that I love so much. And the second thing is whenever I think of the Joker, it's Mark Hamill's Joker. Whenever I think of like what Batman sounds like, if I like try to write a Batman story, like I hear Kevin Conroy's voice, you know, like the first thing I think of when I think of these characters, like, I don't know what man bat looks like in the DC comic universe right now. But I will forever think about what he looks like in in Batman the Animated Series. Like right. they just did such a good job of making these characters, th- these sounds, these voices, everything. Like the and architecture, they just made everything perennial. It is beautiful. Do you remember what Clayface looked like before the animated series? I don't know because no, the animated series Clayface is awesome. Oh, that's yeah, another yeah. that's another great episode. Again, going back to that whole notion of like taking kind of like sci-fi pulpy things and mixing it in with the uh, with the uh with the crime noir like ah oh, just like that scene where he's in the television room and all the TVs are on and, he, he, and he's turning on all the different monitors and and he's like punching them and breaking it's just it, it it's great like ah oh, man I, i'm not going to lie the moment we get off this i'm going to go upstairs i'm going to fire up hbo max I'm going to sit down. I'm going to watch myself some uh, Batman, the animated series in honor of Kevin Conroy. So yeah. Any case, uh, that's all the time we had for comic shop talk after 10. Uh, Thank you so much for joining. Thank you so much, George. Make sure that you check George out on his own podcast, short box summary, which is a fantastic podcast. Uh, You can look for links on our Twitter page as well. It's just, uh, purple bore, purple bird. What? What? One sixty one. One six one six. Six one six. Purple bird. Six one six. Out there on Twitter. And until then, uh, again, last comic shop. Make sure that you tune in this Tuesday for our review of not only Wakanda Forever, but also the uh, Black Panther uh, Penguin Collection uh, that's in bookstores now. So maybe something that you might want to pick up for uh, some comic book loving fans uh, this Christmas season. Right. But make sure you're wearing gloves when you pick it up. (laughs) 
<laughs> it's not that bad. It's Come that on. bad. Anytime I touch any of those penguin books, the fingerprints are all left over. Uh, yeah, that's I because I've been I've been on the penguin train for a while just because they do like really, really good reprints of like classics. And I was an English major in college because I'm a nerd. I'm uh, with you, buddy. Man, I'm with like, you. I, Get my fingerprints going back to like 2008 are like still all over those books on my bookshelf. <laughs> <laughs> but they're so nice. They're so classy. I just wish there was some other way. Yeah, I just I wish it looked like I didn't just you know dip my fingers in honey before I opened them. Like that'd be, <laughs> that'd be awesome. <laughs> all right. Well, hopefully we'll have another comics talk after 10 next week. Until then, uh, we'll see you in the funny pages.